This episode of The Citadel Cafe is brought to you by listeners like you. Visit patreon.com slash the Citadel Cafe to find out how you can become a patron and help make this show possible. This is The Citadel Cafe, episode number 364 for Wednesday, June 10th, 2020. My name is Joel Duggan, and The Citadel Cafe is where my friends and I hang out to talk about the geeky stuff that we are into. Joining me this week is Mr. Lou Page, soon to be Dad Lou Page. Zombies Ate My Podcast is where you can listen to him, and Busy Zombie Lord on all the social media that matters is where you can find him. What's new? Lots of baby prep. We're we're at we're at seven weeks and counting. T minus seven weeks. Good to know. Good I, to know. That's that's well. That's the estimate. That was that's her. That's Erica's due date. But the baby's about a pound and a half heavier than it's supposed to be right now. <laughs> so everybody's anticipating that the baby's going to be at least two weeks early. So what I find so amusing about this is that neither you nor your wife are very large people. <laughs> no. Uh, <laughs> like, it's like, yeah, you're yeah. like you're not you're not both six foot giants making the next you know baby pro wrestler you know like no and, and 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 Erica has put on some weight and she's obviously because she has the baby and she was really concerned that like maybe I'm putting on too much weight and uh, when she goes to the doctor like yeah no 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 like the three pounds the two pounds you put on that's the baby and she's like oh crap. <laughs> Well, I mean, that it sounds good. It sounds like all things are healthy and, and yeah. moving forward, even though it's yeah. going to be a little bit earlier. Although I have to say, like, if you're if Erica is going to deliver early, then maybe you won't be quite into the crazy hot, you know, days of summer. Yeah. Um, better, better than uh, better than been being pregnant too long in the summertime and just wishing the child out because you're dying. Uh, because of how uh, I've heard, I don't, I don't have any firsthand experience, obviously, but I've, I've several friends have had, um, have had children in like August, September, and it's not fun from what I no. can gather. No, no, no. Eric is like, I'm ready. And I'm like, I know you're ready. Let's, 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 let's wait till nature takes its course. It's not, not urgent yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so I mean, not to, not to get too personal, but like, are, are you getting excited? Like, is this. Some, oh, very like, excited. Yeah. In fact, in fact, uh, my, Erica made a new friend thanks to being pregnant. Um, we haven't been able to shop because of everything that's going on. Right. I mean, I don't want to order all our baby clothes off Amazon. That's expensive. Mm -hmm. But we were planning on getting baby clothes at like Goodwill or Salvation Army because, you know, chances are she's going to wear it twice and then we're going to have to get rid of it. Right. So I don't want to pay 10 bucks for an outfit when I can pay a dollar for Something that's hardly been worn. That they're mostly going to spit up on anyway. All that exactly. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. We're trying to be conservative. And so Erica put feelers out on Facebook because the local community group and said, hey, um, anybody got any baby clothes they want to get rid of? And we had every intention of like paying them, paying for them. And some lady said, yeah, no, my daughter is is at nine months. I got zero to I got zero to six in boxes. What's your address? I'll leave them on your porch for you. Wow, that's awesome. So we ended up with, I'm not exaggerating, you know, like the printer style printer paper boxes? Yep. Mm -hmm. We got about 12 boxes. Oh my God. <laughs> that's great. And so afterwards, Erica reached out and thanked the lady and they ended up becoming friends. And we actually went to their house for dinner and kind of... They, they've been housebound like we have too with like little to no interaction with anybody. They're like, why don't you come over for a cookout? We'll sit on far ends of the table and uh, you can see the baby, th their baby. And so we went over there for dinner and I got to actually play with the baby a little bit from a distance. So it, it was fun. It made me very excited because they have a little girl and we have a little girl on the way. On so. the way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's Violet, right? That's the name that you guys... Yep, yeah. yep, yep. Nice. Well, and I'm I'm hoping that the the last stretch is uh, is super super smooth. Well, well, as you were saying, it's getting into the hot months, right? And then yesterday afternoon, we had a disaster in my house. Oh no! Um, I don't know why, but when we bought this house, there is a huge ceiling fan in the bedroom, and I don't mean like ceiling fan. I mean 
bedrooms have ceiling fans. Some do, you know, mm-hmm. that makes sense. This is like a dining room table ceiling fan. Oh my God. <laughs> and it hangs way too low. I'm not exaggerating. It was 25 inches down from the ceiling. Wow. If, if, if I got out of bed the wrong way, uh, I hit the cord with my head. Uh, and if I stood up getting out of the bed the wrong way, I would literally whack my head on the glass. I'm five foot two. <laughs> right. That's low. Yeah. And, and, and the ceiling is pretty high. Like we've got like, like eight to nine feet tall ceilings. Like, so this thing hanging really low and I'm working and Eric is working down here in the basement in the office and out of nowhere we hear boom. And we have two cats and they get into things. They've knocked stuff over. And the, both of us are thinking that the cats did something. And I look over and the, both the cats are sitting with me on the couch while I'm working. <laughs> and I went, well, it wasn't the cats. What the hell? So I walked down the walked and I checked in every room. And lo and behold, the ceiling fan was still in place. But all of the light fixture and all of the glass that's at the bottom piece of the, the, the ceiling fan fell out and smashed all over the floor. I would say, like, and it's a good thing it's not like over the bed or something like, and that happened at night like that. Oh, it be... bounced off the when before it hit the floor, it bounced off the bed. Bounced off the bed. Wow. And I had glass everywhere, and so I cleaned it up the best I could. And then the ceiling fan itself has always made a lot of noise and knock. And Erica said to me, "Yeah, I think it's time we get rid of this stupid thing." Mm-hmm. I said, "Okay." Well, on my lunch break, after I clean up this glass, I'll watch a YouTube video and see if I can replace a ceiling fan. So I watched a, I watched a 10-minute clip of this old house on my lunch break, and the guy showed me how to install a ceiling fan. And then when I got done for work for the day at 3 o'clock, 3.30, I went to, the, went to Lowe's down the street, bought a ceiling fan, and then pulled out the old one, put a new one in in about an hour and a half. <laughs> That's awesome. And I've and I've never done electrical work in my entire life. So the whole time I'm doing it, I'm like, I'm gonna get zapped. I'm gonna blow. <laughs> I'm gonna burn the house to the ground. Something's gonna go wrong. And with nothing went wrong. That's awesome. And that's got that's gonna feel good too. Like that's gonna feel useful, and practical, yes. and there's a lot of pride where you guys on the house and all that and, kind of stuff. That's great. And the best part is, is where this the old one hung like 28 inches down. The new one only hangs like 10 inches down. Right. Like like. I, I had to get up on a ladder to even touch the lamp, touch the ceiling fan. I'm nice. like, oh, this is nice. Yeah, you're not going to give yourself a haircut in the middle of the night anymore. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I did that the other day where I was um, looking up how to pit an olive. I bought cocktail olives because I wanted to make some martinis sometime soon. And unfortunately, got home and realized that, yes, they were cheap cocktail olives, but they had pits in them, which to me is the exact opposite of what you want in a cocktail olive. Yeah. And uh, they're really small. And so I was like, I don't really think I'm going to be able to pit these easily. And so I looked it up quickly online. Same thing. You know, you get a YouTube video, you watch a two to three minute clip and you go, oh, okay. Now, the first one that I found was for black olives. And that made sense because they're bigger and the pits are thinner. And all you do uh, without unless you have like a specialty thing, like a, you know, a cherry or an olive pitter, which is just a small kitchen utensil, uh, it's like pushes a pin through the olive. Um, but for olives, you just take the flat side of a chef's knife and just squish them. Uh, and then when you do that, you can then push out the, the stone and your the olive is still intact. So if you're serving olives on like a plate or something like that, you can still have like the olive as whole, but then the, you know, the, the pit's been pushed out to the side. And, uh, but the guy said, like in the video, this doesn't work for green olives. I was like, crap, because <laughs> that's, that's what I have is the small green ones. Um, but it just, it just, it reminded me of like, you know, how quickly we all just go to YouTube, watch a 10 minute video and can usually learn, you know, enough to solve or at least get you down the right path to, to solve the problem. Uh, I haven't been doing any home improvement around around the house lately. Cause I just, there's, no, I don't, I mean, I rent for starters, but there really isn't much to do. I could maybe paint the kitchen or the bathroom, but like, there's not much that could be done around here. Um, however, um, uh, I found myself with, um, I don't know what to say like sleepless nights, but I feel like I've been 
having more time in the evening. So I've been streaming like a lot on Twitch. Uh, kind of got some um, some steam back in, in Minecraft. And uh, also Minecraft Dungeons came out, which I'm going to talk about here in just a minute. But um, really enjoying my time on Twitch. I've been trying to do like shorter streams. So like weekends will be like three to four hours. But on evenings on a weekday or something like that, I'll be like two hours, hour and a half. It's just something short and sweet, you know, just pop yeah. in, do a little bit of stuff come out uh especially on a game like minecraft dungeons uh but if you're interested then you can check that out at twitch.tv slash joel duggan there are a number of vods that will be up for the next two weeks uh, i've been streaming almost every day so there's probably six or seven videos right now that are up so check it out and and let me know what you think uh i've just been having a lot of fun with it i've been experimenting at different times so depending on where you are in the world you might be able to catch me live you know depending on whether it's first thing in the morning for me or whatever uh, I have been uh, getting up early. You, Lou and I were talking before the show. I've been trying to work out first thing in the morning. And on my off days, I'm still getting up at like 6 a.m. even though I don't have a workout scheduled, which means that I can like stream from 8 to 10 and still have a full work day. Like it doesn't interrupt my actual day. Um, and it's better than That's sometimes. Nice. Yeah, it's better than sometimes streaming at night where it's like, well, I could, but then I'm streaming from like 9 to 10 or 10.30 and I'm, I'm tired at that point like i don't feel like i'm necessarily the, the most lively person on stream now chill streams are good and i've kind of set that precedent so a lot of times when people come to twitch.tv for me uh they expect a, a pretty low-key experience it's not like i'm jumping up and down i'm not on camera so it's it's all just there's no face that also helps yeah no i do i don't need that's not why people are there you, you're not there to see me no you know i i, I, I... I, I used to do extra life and I used to stra stream and the biggest complaint I would get in the chat is we don't want to look at you. We want to look at the game. So get off camera. Yeah. And I'd be like, yeah, that's fine. It's fine with me. Yeah. I'm a podcaster at heart, my friend. Like I've got a face for radio. Uh, and so I, uh, I much enjoy just being able to use the games, especially because the games that I play are generally creative, like Minecraft or uh, like puzzle city builders, that kind of stuff. They're so slow. There's nothing, ex there's nothing, exciting going on it's cool it's cool content but there's nothing like uh shocking it's not horror or first person shooter or competitive stuff where like you'd have an intense reaction from the gamer so it doesn't really mm -hmm. make a lot of sense um, plus it just is one less technical thing to go wrong so why why push your luck right um, yeah but speaking of uh one of the things i wanted to talk about this week for me i haven't been watching a whole lot how i, I have however been playing minecraft dungeons and uh, if you're not familiar it's a new game from Mojang, which is the studio behind Minecraft. And Minecraft Dungeons is a dungeon crawler. It is essentially Diablo, but skinned with Minecraft. Uh, now that's giving it a little bit of an injustice because there's a lot more to it than that. And it's very different from uh, a mechanical perspective in, than Diablo. But it's cartoony, fun. There's swords and arrows and crossbows and Magic. And there's lots of crafting, from what I understand. Uh, no crafting in it, actually, in in Minecraft. Uh, or it, it's like you, you like you can break down the items for bits yeah. to make new weapons. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that, 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 that that's true. that's where it gets really cool. So in in the game, um, you, I mean, it 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 has a very satisfying gameplay. There's really only two buttons. There's your main attack, and then there's your distance attack. So you're either swinging a sword or a hammer or an axe, or you're shooting a bow and arrow. Everybody has both. It just, it, whatever you're holding, you've got both. Now there's different kinds. And and what, what gets complicated is that you can uh, hold up to three artifacts, which are just your hot bar, one, two, three. Uh, or it, you can play with the controller as well. So depending on what buttons you're using for your artifacts. And they do things like, you know, make you do a dodge. Uh, you can um, light things on fire. You can increase your speed. You can increase your damage. You can increase your defense, like stuff like that. So you use them kind of in combination in, in key situations, you know. Um, but what I like so much about the game and where it gets really deep and also continues to be fresh because something this simple can get pretty repetitive like i found diablo pretty yeah. repetitive after oh a while. yeah but here's the thing uh as you progress through the game you level up but you have a power level and as well as a player level and you can collect different weapons based on what difficulty you're playing at now it's really cool there are three different overall difficulties but then within each of those you can choose one through seven as to how you want to play a certain level and obviously the higher the level of difficulty the more fancy the loot is that you get and yeah. everything from armor 
And again, armor slot, there's one, right? So it's very simple. Like you have one oh, weapon, yeah. you've got one armor, you've got three artifacts, and you've got one bow, and that's kind of it. Um, but what's nice about them is that the RNG comes in not only with which armor or which weapon you get, like is it a sword, is it an axe, but they have the ability to be enchanted. And there are a number of different enchants, and it's random as to which one or two enchantments you get on which uh, weapon. And so, for example, one of the ones that I've uh, encountered and have used to my advantage is a enchantment called Echo. And it basically gives you a bonus swing. So every three to five seconds, depending on what level you're at, uh, your weapon will swing a second time, doing the same amount of damage it would do normally. So what's yeah. great about that is that I picked it up on a glaive, which is a pole weapon, and it's slow. It has a great range, but it's not as fast as a sword or daggers or that kind of stuff. So by getting Echo on it, all of a sudden it starts to be nearly as fast as a sword. And because of its strength, it becomes a really, really cool weapon. Now, vice versa, I've had a hammer that has a short range, but it also weakened all the other enemies. So it made me last longer in a fight because even though it wasn't as efficient as yeah. the glaive, it was still reducing their attack on me. So it was almost like having some natural defense. And this is all random. And and then there are like special weapons that just, they have like two enchantments. They have a special name. Uh, they're a different color. And they and they also they always have some sort of fun sound effect or something like i had a, a bow one time in the beta where i can't remember exactly what it was called but when you shot it it made like a spring noise like a warner brothers cartoon like spring you know and the really? arrow and yeah and the arrow went in like a spiral it went straight it always hit your target but it had kind of like a weird like like spiral to it just for no other reason other than that's just kind of a fun thing you know and so when we were talking about this, because we went into a deep dive, I, I won't go too far into the game beyond what I've gone already. Uh, on the Spawn Chunks episode ninety-one, uh, myself and my co-host Johnny did a few, uh, did a, like a full episode Minecraft Dungeons deep dive on on the game, and went into all this kind of stuff. But what we found was you end up playing the game based on what's the most fun, rather than min maxing. Like you're not just yeah. like, well, this sword is more powerful, therefore I must use it. You'll switch to the sword because it is more powerful and realize, huh, that's not as much fun. I don't care. I'm going to go back to the weapon that does 10 less damage because it whistles, you know, or it, it explodes enemies or it does something just fun. And that's what I am getting out of it. It's just, it's a straightforward romp. You're basically bashing zombies and skeletons and all kinds of other, you know, bad guys. Uh, and they're cartoony and they make funny groans and you know, like, and there's a certain satisfaction to smacking a zombie with a, an ax and they spin around like they've just been roundhouse kicked and then they disappear. And like, it's, it is a lot of fun and there's a lot of polish in the game. Um, and, and the more that you play, the more, you know, diverse the items are that you get. And then you find that you switch the way that you play. It's like, Oh, all of a sudden I've gone from a ranged hunter to like a melee person with a claymore sword and a, and a full suit of armor. Like, and it just happens over the course of an hour. Like, well, I guess I'm playing this way now. Cause this is fun. Yeah. And it's great because your, your class quote unquote is tied to your gear, not, yeah. not your person. So I, like I said, it's just, it's, it's just a really fun romp. I've been playing all of my single player playthrough on Twitch. So if you want to see firsthand what it's like to go through, you can check it out at twitch.tv slash Joel Duggan and uh, let me know what you think. Uh, I haven't beaten it yet. Uh, I do find, and this is the one complaint that I have, uh, I do find that there are some bugs uh, in some of the um, levels where you're bounced around a lot. So you can get kind of hung up on some of the geometry, which is not fun. Uh, and in some cases, by pure bad luck, you can get one shotted by boss fights. Yeah, which does not feel good. It like no, you just, I, it's I've, a problem. I've full warning. I've I've read some reviews on this myself, and I've heard from some people that the game gets better after you beat it and you start your second playthrough. Yes, and I've I don't seen... know I, that uh, that's what I keep hearing. Yep, I've and I've seen that essentially what happens is that the first playthrough gives you a test. It gives you practiced all the mechanics, you know, kind of how to play, but then you get into like powerful enchants. I thought that I had seen most of the enchants and turns out I haven't. Uh, there's oh, yeah. all kinds of stuff that comes later. 
Um, yeah. Johnny went through and beat it without any weapons. He beat it. He calls it bare fist Steve. Yeah. And he's basically punching. And he was just using everything he could to augment his speed and augment his attack speed. And it was really yeah. satisfying to watch. Like he's doing very little damage. It's like one damage per swing, but he's punching like a Kung Fu master. Like it, it is really silly. Uh, and so there's all these different ways to play the game. And he, and once he unlocked that second level, then things really start to spiral open because you can get all kinds of different stuff like gauntlets and like all that yeah. kind of stuff. Uh, so yeah, it just, it, it looks like it, it really does open up. I just haven't beaten the last boss cause I'm, I'm not a platformer and the blast boss is kind of like it's less of a diablo fight and more of like a mario fight you know yeah. it's, it's one of those okay. I, i've heard something like that okay yeah that makes sense. yeah and i'm not so i'm not i'm not i'm not a, a grindy uh boss fight guy like if it's not fun i just I, i'll i'll return to it and i'll try to do it a couple times and there is a strategy to it and i know what that strategy is um Without spoilers, I just, I've kind of realized after fighting it once, you're like, yeah, okay, so I need a lot more arrows. And, you know, you, you start to think about what would work. Um, and, um, and the other times that I've died in boss fights in the game, the second time I attempt it, I beat the boss. So it's not like I have to bash my head against the wall. But anyway, I've just, I've been inspired to do other things this week, so I haven't returned to it. But uh, when I do, hopefully I'll, I'll move on and, and we can go from there. But that's, that's basically what's been consuming my week. I've been mostly streaming. I haven't really watched any media. I've been taking my breaks outside and I'll talk about a book in a minute, but, but that's where I, I am. Have you, have you seen any Minecraft dungeons? I think I asked you off, uh, well, offline yeah, uh, if you wanted to play it, but I think you said no. No, it's, it's not for me. Uh, I've played my fair share of Diablo style games and I'll play one on occasion, but they're not usually my cup of tea. Mm. And also I'm not a Minecraft guy. So the aesthetic is to me is not as pleasing as it is for most people that like Minecraft. It, so the Minecraft thing is just because it's familiar. It actually has much better graphics than Minecraft does. So I'm not surprised. Yeah. Like it just, it's so with, with the way that the, the game works it's it's just set in the minecraft universe it's it's almost like if someone just made a diablo thing but made it cartoony you know similar to how mario kart took racing games and just gave them a cartoony spin that's kind of how i would compare yeah. it uh so you yeah. don't you don't have to know anything about minecraft to play minecraft dungeons like you could totally just you know parents could get in there with their kids having never played minecraft at all and just play minecraft dungeons and just beat up zombies like it's, it's just it's really straightforward stuff but cool um so what what have you been up to this past week so i have a question for you because i don't know how canada handles this have you guys been getting pitched hbo max yet no, uh, HBO has an exclusive deal with Bell across the country. So the only way to get access to HBO is through Crave. Uh, Crave okay. is a Netflix-like television streaming service. So it takes things that are on the Bell cable network from certain channels and puts them available on demand for $10 a month. But the library is much smaller than, um, it's much smaller than Netflix and it's only television. It's not films unless yep. you up to the $20 a month. And then $20 a month, you get access to movies and you get access to HBO. And that's how I watched Game of Thrones this past, or two years ago when it was yeah. season eight. Well, okay. So I signed up for HBO to watch the end of Game of Thrones so that we could talk about it on this show. <laughs> and I haven't subscribed to HBO since. As soon as, as soon as Game of Thrones was over, I canceled yeah. and I was done. And that's kind of how I treat HBO is they'll put up a show and I'll wait till the show is either halfway done or whatever. But now HBO was offering this new product, HBO Max. And they kept advertising, we're going to be on all your major streaming uh, services. Like we're going to be able to be, on, we're going to be on Roku. We're going to be on Apple TV. We're going to be on this. We're going to be on that. Uh, trust me, we're everywhere. And it's like an extra like four bucks beyond regular HBO but they claimed they were going to give me access to Cartoon Network and they were going to give me access to like uh, uh, Looney Tunes and they were going to give me access to all the Warner Brothers stuff and they were going to give me access to like some of the animated Justice League movies and all of that stuff. And then they told me, we'll give it to you for the price of regular HBO for the next six months. Just you have to do it before we launch. And I said, well, there's a couple of shows on HBO I want to watch. I'll sign up anyway. 
sounds like a no no big deal. If I don't like it, I'll cancel in a month. And even so if you I forget, sign- it's only four bucks, right? So who cares? Oh no no no! I'm not saying it's four bucks. It's four bucks cheaper. Oh, if you signed up now, because it's going to be twenty bucks a month, or oh. uh, sorry, it's going to be eighteen bucks a month for HBO Max. But they were giving it away for like twelve bucks. I see. And so I said, "Oh, no problem. I'm going to do this." And then it came time to launch. And I went to my Roku and I clicked the button and I said, hey, where's my HBO Max? (laughs) And they went, oh, yeah, by the way, we have a deal with everybody but Roku. (laughs) And I'm like, why didn't they advertise this at all before they tried to get people to sign up? So apparently I went to their website and it's just full. I I don't know if you know this. But 40 to like 50% of streaming households market share is Roku. So HBO Max does not work in 50% of homes in America. Wow. And I was like, okay, well, I can install it on my PlayStation 4 and use it that way. That's how I'll use it. So I installed it on my PlayStation 4, run it through my PlayStation 4. That's fine. No big deal. Then I started browsing their library. And they told me that all of the Warner Brothers DC stuff was going to be on here. Nope. Now, I know you're not a fan of Titans, but we watched it. And Erica was like, I'd like to watch more of that. I'm like, okay, that's not on here. I'm like, well, that sucks. I'm like, what about the old Batman animated series? That's not on here. What about Batman Beyond? Not here. Titans is a Netflix show, so that would explain why it's not. No, it's not in America. In America, it is a Warner Brothers. Um, oh, that's right. It's it, it's not, and uh, they were ever. Uh, uh, Doom Patrol is on this, but it's the only Warner Brother. Uh, it's the only product from. It's the only thing that's from the DC Universe streaming service here in America that's on the same service as this, huh. even though they're all owned by the same company. licensing man like it just it, i see that all the yeah. time like when I, I i talked about spider-man far from home last week and uh i couldn't stream it anywhere the only place to stream it is is on crave hbo movies and i was just like i'm not paying 20 dollars to watch one movie yeah uh, and uh but it's uh, but yet you have a lot of the stuff that's uh marvel canon still split between disney plus and netflix because netflix still oh, had like long-standing right. licensing rotations right yeah, here in America, that's almost gone now. Uh, almost everything from Netflix has now moved to Disney Plus. Mm. Almost all of it. But so, I, I and I went, oh wait, they said I'd be able to watch Rick and Morty, and Rick and Morty is like just wrapped up their season. So I was like, sweet, I'll go watch season four of Rick and Morty. Nope, they only have seasons one through three, which, by the way, I can stream on two other services I subscribe to. <laughs> It's it's such a spaghetti mess right now. Like it's every every I, company is all over the place. So so Erica and I said, well, I'm only gonna pay for this for a month, and then I'm canceling this unless they add themselves to Roku. Uh I said, so let's see what we can find, and we came across Avenue Five. Have you heard of this? I think I saw like an Instagram trailer, so it wasn't even a full trailer. I only it's, watched the trailer just before the show today because you said that you were going to talk about it. Okay, it's like a comedy version in space of the Titanic. <laughs> um, Hugh Laurie is the captain of a ship called the Avenue 5 that's on a cruise around the solar system. And it's supposed to take eight weeks and it's full of passengers and it was bought by this rich guy. The whole uh, the whole uh, cruise line, space cruise line service is owned by like the richest guy on earth. And he's like a cross between uh, 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 what's his name that owns Tesla? Oh, um, Elon Musk. He's like an Elon Musk meets Donald Trump meets like Bill Gates. And he's super obnoxious. And he wants to be on this ship. So he's on there with the captain. And 
he makes he walks around literally pointing at things and being like, no, I don't like the way that looks. Take it out. And he tells somebody to do something, and it causes the gravitational of the ship ship to veer off course. So instead of eight weeks for them to make an orbit and come back to Earth, it's going to take three and a half years. <laughs> It sounds like a Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy sort of like... It's exactly what this is. Yeah. It's like Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. And so they're stuck on course. And so they're all trying to figure out... And in the meantime, you find out that Lou, Hugh Laurie, who's the captain of the ship, isn't really the captain of the ship. The maintenance guy is the real captain of the ship. He's just the figurehead actor that's been put there to make everybody feel comfortable. <laughs> So it's really and bizarre. It, like, it sounds like and, it's got and, some serious... And, and eight minutes in, the mechanic di- gets killed <laughs> in the disaster. So they have no captain. And the cap- and, and Hugh Laurie thinks, I'll just go up to the, to the crew deck and I will uh, talk to the guys on the crew deck and see if they can, like, you know, kind of veer us back on course. No, no, no. Almost all of the headings and stuff is done back on Earth remotely. And they're already on, on, on course. They can't go back. They're stuck with the three-year course. And now he's got to tell all these, these like, 5,000 people on board this cruise ship, they're stuck on board the ship for three and a half years till they can get home. Right, which I thought was going to be, like, eight weeks. Or like... Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, oh, and, and, and everything that can go wrong goes wrong for them. And every time you think you have an idea of what's going on, like, at one point they can send, like, they can't take anybody back, but they can send a shuttle to resupply them with food, but it's a tiny shuttle. Like, they don't have room to get people back. And, like, there ends up being one seat, and they end up fighting over the seat so that one person can go back to Earth, and then the wrong person goes back. (laughs) Like, the whole show is full of that. There's one lady that's super obnoxious. She ends up becoming, like, the liaison between the crew and the people. It's really funny. Yeah, it sounds like a... Was it like like a calamity of I can't remember the name like there's a phrase I'm trying to draw up but it's like it it sounds like a calamity comedy right like yeah. just just when something goes wrong something else goes wrong it's like a domino and, and, effect and, and my favorite thing is is I wa- I know you watched it for years but you watched House with you Lori I did and I've also seen some of his old comedy skit okay. work as well so when the show begins he starts talking and you get that he's is he's using his american accent he sounds just like house and you're like oh that's cool i was hoping he would get his british accent but okay i guess we're gonna get his fake american accent (laughs) i'll take it and then like halfway through the first episode he starts talking and the british accent comes out and you're like wait a minute something's wrong here and then even the cast even the crew on the ship is like wait a minute you're sounding really british what's wrong with you and that's when he tells everybody he's an actor and that people <laughs> feel more comfortable with an American accent. So that's why he's doing. So like throughout the whole series, every time he talks to certain people, he talks an American accent, and then he talks to somebody else in a British accent <laughs> and he just drops between them in the middle of a scene. And you're like, you're like, that's really cool. I've never seen an actor just go. Duh, 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 duh. Yeah, the way they just switch it up. That's that's yeah. yeah, that he's also very good at that too. Like I, yes. I he's a very he's a very talented actor, but also very funny, very dry. I really I, yeah. I I enjoy I enjoy his sense of humor. Uh anytime that I've seen him on clips from the Graham Norton show, it's always been very, very funny. Yeah. Especially yeah. because Graham Norton got his start doing skit comedy as well. And yeah. so they have like that camaraderie and, and that history. And I but... think they did some work like that together too. So nice. Is there any uh, any other DC stuff that's streaming right now? Uh, not streaming, but it was on sale, so I bought it. I got Birds of Prey. I've heard really good things. It's really good. If you didn't like Suicide Squad, it's everything that was kind of good about Suicide Squad without being Suicide Squad. Nice. Um, it's more fun than Suicide Squad. It's more upbeat and happy than Joker. Uh, if you've seen that, because that's a little depressing. Yeah, so I didn't see Joker, and Birds of Prey was released January twenty fifth, and I don't. I mean, I don't think the pandemic was really in full tilt around here until March, but February there was definitely 
news reports and stuff starting to happen. So I wonder if maybe Birds of Prey, maybe you got a little bit ransacked by... I, I think it did. But uh, one of the streaming ser uh, services I use, Vudu, had it on sale. And instead of being like 20 bucks like it normally was, for like a weekend, you could buy the movie, or you could rent the movie for the regular like three ninety nine price, or you could buy it for like 7 Nice. And I went, I was like, for the extra three bucks, I'll just buy it. Mm -hmm. And so if you liked Harley Quinn in Suicide Squad, which was about the only thing likable in that movie, uh, she's basically back doing the same whole role. She's the narrator of your story. So it's very unreliable na narrator where like something will happen and she'll be like, oh yeah, I forgot to tell you about this other thing. And then the movie will completely change directions for like 10 minutes <laughs> and she'll and it will jump back to something that happened like, like six months earlier. And then you'll be like, oh, that's why that guy's mad at her. And, the, or she'll get, you'll get introduced to somebody and she'll like have a conversation with them. And then she'll be like, oh yeah, I never explained who they were. Did I? And then like, she'll go into it like after like 10 minutes of scenes with them. And so it, it's, it, it's fun in that regard. Uh, she basically goes around destroying Gotham for about 90 minutes. All because Ewan McGregor's character, the Black Mask, is looking for something and she happens to have it. Oh, Ewan McGregor plays like a Black Mask. I, I He's saw, the bad guy. I saw the Black Mask in the trailer, but I didn't make the connection that it was that it was him. That's cool. Oh, yeah. He's a good He's, actor. It, he's a good actor. He's doing an American accent. And he only wears the mask a couple of times in the movie. Most of the time it's his face. Mm -hmm. And he's just flamboyant and like over the top in everything, but in a fun way, not in an unbelievable way. He's like the he's like the mob boss that wants everything and everybody does everything to make him happy. And now he's not getting what he wants, so he's throwing temper tantrum. 80s bad guy. Yes. And like at every moment you can tell he was just having way too much fun. That's I love movies like that. I really like it when you can tell that the actors are just having a blast. Like I, I would imagine that Margot Robbie just has an absolute ball doing stuff like this. And, 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 and the movie is just full of weird, fun things. Like at one point they're having a fight with, there's a bunch of female characters. They're beating up a bunch of mob guys. And the scene began like five minutes ago. And then out of nowhere, Harley Quinn rolls by on roller skates and one of the other character goes, when did she have time to do a shoe change? And, you, and, and you're like, <laughs> and, and, and like the movie like acknowledges that it's ridiculous at every turn. Right. Whereas like that, that totally makes sense in a cartoon and you don't question it. But when it happens in the film, you have to draw attention to it. Otherwise it looks like a weird error. Yeah. Things like things go wrong. Uh, like everything is like a is like a is like a joke, a, 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 in a fun way, and it's it's very girl power. Like the whole movie, all the heroes are women. All they do is kick the ass out of mo uh, male mob bosses wearing masks. It's really fun. I uh, I misspoke earlier. The world premiere was January twenty fifth. United States release was February seventh, but it was on home video by March twenty fourth. So that the on-demand home video sounds like a response to to COVID. Yeah, it was. It yeah. was. It did. It did terrible in theaters here, but that was because we shut everything down like two weeks in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's too bad because it did, like I again like I I have a couple of friends that saw it here in theaters locally and they they loved it. Um, members of the like cosplay play community locally and and uh, both female cosplayers and they were just like, this is amazing. Erica went into it skeptical because she didn't enjoy Suicide Squad, but she liked Harley in it. And she was like, well, I guess we'll give this a shot. I was like, I'll watch it alone. And she's like, no, I'll watch it. By the end, she was just, she was like, that was awesome. I kind of want to watch it again. And I was like, wow, that, that that says something. I think that some of the villains in DC have more potential in some ways than than the heroes do. Heroes. Because the heroes yeah. are so clean cut, like in terms of like, not necessarily like goody two shoes, but like they're just, they're so... It's such a One narrow, dimensional. yeah. It's such a narrow margin that they have to walk. Like you can't really bring depth to Batman. He's Batman, and people don't really want depth in Batman. I don't think. No, you know, and it's the same thing with me and Superman. Like, I mean, I think they did some. I I liked, you know, Henry Cavill in um, Man of Steel, and and I mean, again, 
they're not good movies. Uh, no. But I like Henry Cavill in them, you know, in yeah. terms of in terms of like Justice League and, and Batman v Superman. I actually I quite liked um, the the Bruce Wayne, uh, Deanna Troy, not, not Deanna Troy. What did I say? Um, it's not. It's Diana. Uh, uh, her last name. Diana Prince. Prince. Jeez. Well, I got Star Trek on the brain. Um, but yeah, uh, Diana Prince for Wonder Woman, like with Gal Gadot and uh, and Ben Affleck. Like I thought they had a real chemistry. Like it, that kind of stuff, I really enjoyed. Again, not a great movie. Justice League was terrible, but but those interactions are things that I live for in in those kind of superhero films. And um, when you can do that with Harley Quinn and some of the other you know characters in, in DC films uh, for bad guys, uh, I think you can create some some interesting stuff. Like again. I don't dislike the Nolan Batmans, but I, they're not, in hindsight, they're not the best, but I really thought voice first... aside, Bane was interesting. Like they, they were able to do something interesting that was still watchable, right? Yeah. I'd rather watch that Bane than a CG Bane. Do you know what I mean? Like I don't want the yeah. Hulk, you know, fighting Batman. Uh, and so like, yeah, there's, there's some things that could be explored too. And I think too, especially with the Batman villains, like they're so, they're so opposite to Batman. Like they're so colorful and so over the top. And, um, I didn't see Joker, but it's too bad. Cause I, I didn't like Jared Leto's Joker in Suicide Squad. Um, well, I don't know if you know this cause I've actually recently watched Joker as well. It's a period piece. It takes place in the eighties. Yes. It's I not, know that. Uh, okay. So I don't believe it's supposed to be the same Joker. Oh yeah, no, I knew that. I just the 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 Joker that Harley Quinn. Oh wait a minute. So Birds of Prey is a period piece? No, no, no. Birds of Prey is current. Right. But Joker itself is a period is a period. Piece. Yes. No, I knew that film was. Uh, but I thought how it's, that <laughs> how, it's, how it's even going to tie into the DC universe or at all? Because at first it wasn't, and now it is, and they're talking about doing a sequel. I. I Warner Brothers is a mess. I can't follow any oh, of it anymore. Yeah, no, I don't even try. I, don't I just know try. I watched Birds of Prey and it was fun. <laughs> yeah, so, and, but Jared Leto's Joker, that's the Joker that's tied to Harley Quinn yeah. in Birds of Prey. Like, that's, yeah, okay, that's, that's. What they I'm don't have, he's not in it. You don't no. ever see him. They don't ever rent, they, they don't even show him. Like, they, all they have, hint at is that him and harley had a fight and they show somebody pointing to a door and it's a hand and you never see his face yeah so uh, in the i again because i knew you wanted to talk about this i watched the trailer because i didn't see the trailer actually uh before and she is monologuing talking about like her breakup with mr j and she's the, the yeah, whole movie is that yeah so she and so she she drives a truck and explodes a chemical plant. Like, and that's all you see. That's all, that's all the trailer yeah. really shows you. And I thought and you, you get the gist. Like she that, broke, broke up with him Harley style, basically blew up a bunch of stuff. Um, yeah. But yeah, it looks like a lot of fun. I, I will put it on my, my watch list. Cause I could use some fun superhero stuff. Uh, I, it, like I said, it's a lot of fun. Uh, and I don't know if you'll get it if you rent it, but because I bought it, I got the special features. Oh, cool. And they have an entire like 10 minute gag reel of like them screwing up lines and bursting out laughter. And there's a clip of Hugh and McGregor and it's like he can't keep the line straight at all. Like they got him improvising and he screws it up every single time and just can't stop laughing at himself. And I was like, I could just watch this for an hour. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's really cool when, when you can tell the other actors are, are having a good time. Uh, in a completely opposite direction. Nothing to do with superheroes at all, uh, and nothing to do with even uh, digital media at all. I actually have been reading a book that I am embarrassed to say has been on my shelf for the better part of a year, uh, and I just haven't had the time to to crack it open. But I, uh, I've i been taking the time to read. It's been nicer outside. So lunch breaks are generally outside on my balcony with a book, uh, lunch, and a coffee. And I have been reading Celtic Fairies, the deluxe edition by my friend J.B. Monge. Uh, I had the pleasure of meeting uh, JB back in like 2016. He was a guest here at one of the conventions in Halifax. And I ended up interviewing him on Comics Coast to Coast. Uh, I'll have the links to both episode 270 and 273 in the show notes for this week. Uh, first part was actually JB here in my studio uh, in, in Dartmouth. And the second part, uh, Brian Dunaway joined me. And we brought JB in again on, um, on the show 
uh, via, I think at that time it would have been Skype. Um, so it was more of a traditional comics coast to coast episode at that point. And I'm pretty sure I'd have to go back and listen, but I'm pretty sure that 273 came about three weeks later because he was launching the Kickstarter or announcing the Kickstarter for Celtic fairies, which is how I got it. I supported it on Kickstarter. I don't think you can buy the book anymore. Hard copy. It's been four years. Um, I didn't get mine until, like I said, last year, because it was actually quite a long production. They had the, some overseas stuff that caused some delays. Uh, you can, however, get it on Etsy and through his website. I'll have both links in the show notes as well. And uh, I really enjoyed it. It is, um, there's a lot to read. There was more to read than I thought, because I thought I was getting an art book. And you do, there's a ton of phenomenal, phenomenal uh, well, the pieces artness in it. is amazing. Oh, dude, he is, not only is he just ridiculously talented just as a draftsman, just as a, as a put a pencil in the man's hand and he's just a monster. Um, but all of his stuff, uh, or I shouldn't say all of it, most of the work in the book is traditional. So watercolor, gouache, pencils. I, he does some digital stuff and I've seen him do a mix of both where he'll he'll scan in a pencil drawing and then he'll do like digital watercolor on top of it. Uh, but it's the same process and it produces the same sort of tactile look. And there's just something timeless about the idea of fairies and goblins and gnomes and all that kind of fun stuff and little creatures when it's hand-drawn. There's just something about it that feels like a, an illustrated manuscript as opposed to digital right. concept art for video games and stuff like that. All cool, but there's a you can't get the bright and shiny from traditional media with watercolor and pencils that you can with digital stuff. And so everything yeah. just has this matted, more earthy feel to it. And it just feels more realistic as, as I say, I know I'm talking about fairies, but like it just, it, it, <laughs> it, it, it feels down to earth, pardon the pun. Um, but yeah, like I just, I really enjoyed it. And the 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 only criticism I have of the book itself is that the layout is a little bit hard to follow and they try they give you a lot of information. So let's say you're looking at something that's called a boglin or a boggy or a bog elf or like they give you like six or eight definitions as to what it is. Basically they're kind of covering the folklore of every place from Scotland to Wales to the Isle of Man to you know, South England, like, so they, they try to cover all the bases, but in doing so, right. they kind of shovel a lot of information at you at once to the point where you get to the bottom of the paragraph. And you're like, well, wait a minute, what was this thing called again? You know, like, and, and right. Cause it, and it, even that, like it's like, oh, it would behave like this in Ireland, but in Scotland, it would behave like this. It's like, well, just give me a general kind of consensus on it. But a lot of it seemed to be pulled from other fairy like literature and all of, obviously it's literature. Um, I think one of the people that they quote a lot is Peter, Peter Grogan from like the late 1800s. And so a lot of it, I think is stuff that inspired JB to do, to do the work in the first place. And, right. and so they wanted to be true to that. And um, I would imagine any kind of literature that tries to piece together folklore, which is nothing but just, you know, the game of telephone over centuries. Uh, it would be very hard to pinpoint a real definition of like, what is a fairy? What is an elf? You know, what is a boglin? All that kind of stuff. Uh, but the lessons learned throughout the book uh, were basically like, we're all led to believe that fairies are magical and friendly and very much like Tinkerbell and Peter Pan. Not the case. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, much like most folklore, uh, in the, you know, 16 through 1800, it was basically meant to keep you in line. So don't cut across the neighbor's property. Don't go walking out in the fog cause you could get lost. And the idea was like, don't go out and walk in the fog because the fairies are going to get you. <laughs> like, yeah. just, and yep. they, they're always portrayed as like pretty and delicate and magical and dangerous and it's always like they're just basically moody you have no idea whether you're going to offend a, a fairy or an elf or if you're going to befriend them there's just it's kind of like a flip of a coin as to whether you're going to have good luck or bad luck you know it's like how was their exactly. day because if they had a bad day you're going to have a bad day and it's uh it was a lot of fun it was very interesting to to see and something that that jb does with his artwork which i always find so so cool is he presents a sense of scale with things like buttons or candles or matchsticks 
uh, a lot of the little folk will have something with them that is our size. Yeah. So they'll be like serving dinner. You know, these little fairies are serving some bread and cheese on a, on a platter. And the platter's a button. So you're like, oh, wow. Okay. These, these things are tiny in this particular, you know, situation. And then you see, uh, you know, something that has more of like, you know, more of like a satyr or like a goat bottom, you know, and horns and he's playing a flute and you realize, okay, well, that's more like a three and a half foot tall sort of, you know, mystical thing. It's not a tiny, tiny fairy the size of a mushroom cap. And so everything has all these different senses of scale. Sometimes you'll see, um, you know, a little brownie or uh, a house elf riding like the back of a bird or the back of a raccoon. So you can kind of say like, all right, well, the, the one on the back of the bird is probably only a couple inches tall, but the one on the back of the raccoon is more like a foot tall. Like, so you can kind of get a sense of scale. Um, what I find very funny is that the animals are always quite happy to have these things riding them, <laughs> which is, yeah. just, it seems so strange, you know, especially when you've got a fairy with wings riding a bird with wings. It's a beautiful image, but after a while you're like, what, what's the practical <laughs> sense here? <laughs> Uh, one of my favorite images is, is, a, a picture of a, of a fairy riding a chickadee, which is one of my favorite little birds. And it's just, there's such a, there's such attention to detail, uh, that you really just, you can't help, but just imagine these things flitting around, you know, even North America, um, in the woods, you know, when you go hiking and all that kind of stuff. And, um, he even has a section in the book about the, the exodus of the fairies from, Ireland and, um, and the English, you know, kind of isles, uh, during like the great potato famine and during the, the late, you know, 17 and early 1800s when they had to leave. And in some cases, the fairies were bound to families. So when the families left for North America, they had to go with them. And then, yeah. then they adopted, uh, the new, the new customs of the North American fairies, which he, they didn't go into because the book was focused on Celtic fairies. But anyway, it's a fantastic read. It's available for digital download. I think it's like 25 bucks or something. And it's beautiful. If, especially if you have like a big tablet, something large enough where you can enjoy the artwork. Uh, if not, you can always, of course, go to JB Monge uh, on, online. I think it's just jbmonge.com. Yes, it is. Uh, and, uh, I'll have a link to his art station portfolio as well. Uh, heads up on the art station stuff. Uh, his website's pretty family friendly, but art station is, uh, got some mature content, nothing grotesque. It's just that there's a lot of figure drawing. Sometimes fairies don't have tops on. So it's, it's like, it's not, it's not yeah. like outwardly, you know, anything inappropriate. It's just, it's, it's nudity based on like art, the same way that you'd see nudes in, you know, Renaissance paintings, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, so it's not safe for work depending on where you are. Uh, but all of it is just fantastic. And if uh, fairies are not your cup of tea, a lot of the work that JB has done has been for th places like Disney Imagineering, Sony Pictures Entertainment, and Blizzard. Uh, he did a lot of concept art for Diablo 3. And so a lot of the demons and stuff that he draws are just as detailed and just as, um, whim not whimsical, but like just as magical and ethereal as some of his more um, fun drawings. And, uh, it's kind of weird when you look at them, you're like, wait a minute, this came from the same dude. <laughs> like it just, you've got this demon with like, you know, it's guts hanging out and it's skull on the outside of his face. And, you know, you got blood dripping everywhere. And then the next thing is like this little pixie having, you know, tea with a grasshopper. <laughs> you're like what? You know, it's just, it's two different sides of the same coin. It's all, all very, very fun. So I really enjoyed the book. And I think that the, the folks, uh, in this audience would really enjoy, the the content as well because of the we've talked about dungeons and dragons a lot lately we've done a lot of that kind of stuff and I, I think it'd be really 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 cool well that brings us into the internet minute which is of course brought to you by you if you are a supporter of this podcast on patreon i very much thank you it is one of the reasons we are ad free and have been for the entirety of the podcast you can visit patreon.com slash the citadel cafe if you'd like to become a member Every member at the moment gets access to the uh, bonus episodes, the barista cuts. Uh, normally that's at the barista level, but during the uh, pandemic, I thought I'd you know give access to everybody, more to listen to, more fun behind the scenes stuff as I have extra conversations with the different people that are on the show. Uh, so once again, that is patreon.com slash the Citadel Cafe. And we're looking for one more patron to make us uh, one more ahead of May. We're currently at 20 in June and I'd like to be 21 in July. If you want to be that person, then head over to patreon.com slash the Citadel Cafe. I do not have a pick this week, but Lou, you do. I do. Uh, there is a service called Ichio. I've never really used it, uh, but it's mostly indie games and other things, and they kind of let you self-publish. 
Uh, they've put together a bundle because of all the craziness that's going on. We won't get into it. Uh, and for $5, you can support a pretty good cause, and you get about 1,500 games. Wow, that's a lot. Yeah. I ain't gonna tell you that they're, they're all good. But there's a... <laughs> there's about... I was scrolling through the list of 1,500 games, and I came across about maybe a dozen that are actually on my Steam wish list, and I was like, huh, for 5 bucks, I can get that game. And all those games that have been sitting on my wish list for a while, and then I can remove them from my Steam wish list. Yeah. No, and that's... And I, I mean, I, I recognize at least three of the games right off the top of my head. You know, like I've, I've seen uh, Celeste. I've heard about a short hike. I've heard a lot of good things about a short hike as well. Uh, and then Overland was also something that has been on my radar recently. I don't remember why, but I recognize yeah. them. And usually when you see bundles like this for five bucks, it's like, I have no idea what any of this kind of stuff is. But yeah, like I have, I already own Night in the Woods on Steam, but that's a pretty good game. Uh, there's a lot of stuff here that I was just like, wow. Uh, some of these I already own, but I wouldn't mind owning another copy. Nice. Uh, I, I like that there's even game assets. Like you can down, like you get like yep. a bunch of assets. If you, if you are a, an indie gamer and you wanted to experiment with making your own game, they'd give you some access to stuff like yeah, that. They got about five or six more days left on this. Uh, originally it was less, way less games. Uh, they're like adding more games to this. Like, ev like, like, like actually there's about 50 more games here than there was the last time I looked. Nice. That's awesome. The title of the bundle is uh, Bundle for Racial Justice and Equality, and all of the proceeds will be donated to the NAACP Legal Defense and Education Fund and the Community Bail Fund, uh, both worthy, worthy causes, of course. And uh, I think that's that's great. Like such such and such a smart thing to grab some indie games and have them at such a low price point. Like it's no yeah. wonder that they've raised over four million dollars. Um, yeah. that's, that's fantastic because it just, it's a no brainer. Like, I mean, five bucks. Sure. You know, like I'll, I'll check out uh, a short hike for five bucks, you know, and that, and that's yeah. just one. And there's a lot of other things. The only thing I think might, that might be problematic is just the par paralysis of choice. <laughs> you know, it's like, yep. what, what, what do and, I do uh, now? This is, this is not a problem for me. This is already a problem with my steam. I have this many steam games. So yes. Yeah. 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 Cool. Well, I, I am looking forward to checking out more, uh, after the show because I uh, I only just looked at this just before we started to hit record and uh, there's a lot of really interesting stuff here. Um, I've actually had, I had a commission a while ago for a character from Nuclear Throne and I've yep. never, I've never played the game and I'd, I'd never heard of it, but the, my, my client was just like, you have to do this. Like, okay, <laughs> like, I'll look up the character and draw it for you, but I had no idea what was going on. Um, that's very, a fun cool. game actually that's yeah, a fun game i've heard yeah from from what they described it was right up my alley because obviously it was a very cartoony commission and so the, the game was was in that that elk well that brings us to the end of this episode of the citadel cafe you can find more info about the show and links to all of the things that lou and i talked about at the citadelcafe.com music for the show was composed by kevin mcleod you can email us at the citadel cafe at gmail.com or find us by name on twitter subscribe on itunes android stitcher spotify and now youtube go over and hit subscribe we're only a few away from getting a custom url over there on youtube but you know what? Word of mouth is the easiest way to support the show. Just tell a friend that they should listen to the Sizzle Cafe and where to find it. It's pretty straightforward. You can find us by name on any platform. Uh, just give us a listen and hopefully you will stick around for more. Leave a star rating on the Apple Podcasts app or your podcast platform of choice. That is also a free way to spread the word about the show. Uh, when podcast apps are looking for stuff, uh, they tend to ping stuff that has the highest rating. So if you're listening and you're enjoying us, then just go over to the Apple Podcasts app and leave a review. It's, uh, it's a big help. My name is Joel Duggan. You can find everything I am doing online, including my illustration and design portfolio at joelduggan.com. You can find my other podcast at thespawnchunks.com. That's all about Minecraft and also about Minecraft Dungeons as of late. So if you're interested in that, check that out at thespawnchunks.com. And of course, I am at Joel Duggan on all the social media that matters. And I will point you towards twitch.tv slash Joel Duggan, where I'm doing a lot of really fun stuff live. So come hang out. Lou, where can people find you online? Easiest place to find me is on all social media under the name Busy Zombie Lord. And you can also check out my show, uh, Zombies Ate My Podcast, where next week uh, Ryan and I are going to talk about the season two premiere of Last Kids on Earth, a preteen zombie kids cartoon. You've been listening to the Citadel Cafe, where we are fast, easy, and cheap, but you can only pick two. <laughs>